We must speak the truth about terror. Let us never tolerate outrageous conspiracy theories, malicious lies that attempt to shift the blame away from the terrorists themselves. Take you over, right? What happens? I tell you what happens. Wham! I have a window that looks directly at the World Trade Center, and I saw... No collusion! Shit's getting way too complicated for me. Yeah. This is, as you can see here, this is the antidote on video. Uh, we are uh, live on location. Where are we at, Jeremy? We are outside of the comedy club. What's it called? The, the Improv Comedy Club. Kansas City Improv. Kansas City Improv, very north Kansas City, pretty close to the Kansas City airport, outside of a Jimmy Dore show. We're not going to be going into the show, but we decided to do a little bit of informationeering. We have a poster that we made up that is says Jimmy Dore misinformed about 9-11 and 11-9. Trump, Putin, BB, MBS, and MBZ. And we're also going to be recording an actual antidote episode out here about what we mean by uh, Jimmy Dore misinforms about 9-11 and 11-9. Yes, and um, obviously people who pay attention to us know we've been on this for, for a little while. Um, but I think right now, domestically, Jeremy, we're seeing like a real escalation of a lot of, uh, a lot of things that we've been talking about for a while. So it's way, even way more, this is way, this is a way bigger deal than even just like a specific event. And, uh, I mean, obviously the events themselves are of vital importance, but there's a lot of meaning around uh, there's, impl there's bigger implications with what's going on in our society right now about these events. It's not just what happened in an election as important as that is, but it, 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 it goes back to the entire state of our domestic affairs right now, I think. Uh, with so, so much of what's going on from COVID to the escalation of the weaponized culture wars once and again. And which I also have critical beef with Jimmy about how his take on COVID, and I, I, I believe it plays into the culture war weaponization of the obviously constructed COVID divide. Now, I agree with him on many of his takes about it, but the, in general, he seems to have played the role of the sort of the COVID minimizers while weaponizing this sort of straight sort of kind of, so many of them do real false solutions in relationship to specific off-label drugs and all that, rather than basic things such as vitamin D, basic things such as airflow, basic things as understanding the, the quality of masks in certain places, and he basically just played into a specific role that, that uh, you know, garnered him a very specific audience, I think. And so I would add, in addition to 9-11 misinforming and 11-9 Trump uh, BB, NBC, MBS misinforming, I would add an aspect of what we've called the newest 311 uh, when the COVID-19 uh, pandemic was announced, uh, where I believe he plays a role in misinforming too. But we'll, if we have time, we can get into that too. For sure, and it's, um, I guess, it's not to say that we disagree with everything, because there's a lot of things that we would be in agreement about. There's a lot of uh, good that comes, I think, elements of what is discussed in terms of like a lot of very serious actual progressive minded change minded people are very much drawn to someone like a, a Jimmy Dore and I think there's a lot of reasons that's understandable but I think that there's also a problem that comes with that in terms of like we talk all the time about the weaponizing of narratives and, uh, and uh, politics and all this and this is a classic example of that because I think that it's okay, so, we're in the that way, sure. so much bigger than just like uh, like, so and so and so's wrong about this, this, and this. Like, it's way more nuanced than that. And that's one thing we always try to do here at the Antidote is provide nuance to issues that you may otherwise think are black and white. And there's yeah. a lot of shades of gray yeah. to this. And this is part of a key cog, media cog, in terms of something much bigger that's going on with, like, a, it's basically a. It's, it's a media wide problem we have in so many ways. And it, it encompasses so many different types of media activism circles and this is one example of this but a big problem is that there's all these important issues which trickle down to these other things that are going on bigger societal picture right now there's a there's a misinforming about this and there's also a very I, I think it's kind of a condescending smartest man in the room uh, anybody anybody who 
believes in this stuff or believes that anything nefarious went on in 2016 is an idiot or a moron. And we're the real, like, we're the actual resistance because we're actually going to call out these people on the things that they are doing bad. But this nonsense about Russia and foreign interference is just um, is taking us away from that. And that's something that has been going on, I'd probably say, since the early parts of the Trump administration, at the very least since really Jimmy Dore really split away from the Young Turks ideologically, as there was this, uh, as you remember, before the 2016 election, it was Jimmy Dore and Jake Uger and Anna Kasparian all together <laughs> uh, confronting Alex Jones, or being confronted by Alex Jones and Roger Stone at the Republican National Convention. There's a lot more meaning to that whole encounter uh, after the fact, actually thinking back about it. Larry. <laughs> And um, the uh, you know there's a lot a lot built into that encounter, there, especially since it's like the very beginning, really, of like the solidification of political poison merchant uh, dictators, lobbyists, Roger Stone coming in as uh, Alex Jones's main side wing at that point, and Jimmy Dore at that point seems to be the most reactive to Alex Jones in terms of his aggression and all of that. I believe it was Jimmy Dore who spit on Alex Jones yeah. at that. Was that true? Uh, yeah. And so that was a big encounter there. And when thinking back about what we know now in terms of how the Republican Party was led to, to that moment, really, yeah. in terms of Arthur Finkelstein, the, the uber Republican uh, dirty ops guru, actually shoehorned Trump into the Republican mainstream when there was a little bit of suspicion about him by the, what you might call the GOP establishment. And we now know that then Paul Manafort, obviously Roger Stone's uh, wingman in terms of the dictator's lobby. Now, Paul Manafort was even more deeply involved in the Russian sphere oligarchical, the deep state operatives in relationship to Deripaska, yeah. his work in Ukraine in 2004, which the, the whole crew that sort of surrounds even Jimmy Dore to this day in terms of giving the information about Ukraine will always leave out the 2004 yeah. attempted election coup in Ukraine, which was orchestrated by Paul Manafort's circle. And they even brought, it looks like they brought in Rove's IT guru, Mike Connell, who looks to have been the guy who helped orchestrate the election fraud uh, for Bush in Ohio 2004, along with a whole bunch of Center for National Policy, CMP guys, including Ken Blackwell in Ohio, and that Manafort brought, brought Connell into Ukraine, it looks like. Now, Manafort, at this point, he's going, starting to go on his book tour, and he's claiming he had no involvement in the actual uh, election fraud in Ukraine. In 2004, and that he was brought in after the fact. However, it's very interesting that very recently, when he went on this uh, such that podcast, oh, I can't remember what it's called, like Valuetainment. Valuetainment. It's the guy who does Valuetainment. Yeah, he's done interesting interviews. He's yeah. interviewed Alex Jones in depth. He did an interview with Bernard Carrick. He's interviewed <laughs> Ron Paul. So I mean, he's got a lot of interesting names. And now this is Paul Manafort's first major full-length interview. And I mean, he's done a shorter interviews with like Sean Hannity, but I think this is his first major full-length interview that he's like podcast type of interview he's done since he's begun promoting the book that's going to be coming out in August. Yeah, and uh, what's very interesting, that same guy, uh, Ben David, I think his name is, uh, grew, up, grew up in Iran early, actually, when he was young. He just hosted a uh, libertarian candidate uh, debate roundtable kind of thing I saw. But when Manafort was on there last week, I think it was, Manafort, there's two very clear areas of sensitivity. Manafort, it sort of seems, I could see Manafort being being re-welcomed into some of these sort of MAGA adjacent kind of circles, such as Tim Pool's podcast, who, who brought Bannon in as their new favorite uh, political whisperer, basically. And Manafort has the same kind of smooth uh, communicator, very uh, steady, very coherent, and very convincing in the way that he talks. He's a lobbyist, after all. He's a dictator's lobbyist. I could see Manafort being brought back in and washed back through this the Tim Pool kind of uh, kind of circle. But these two areas where Manafort was so obviously uncomfortable, and this is exactly the area where I think that uh, you know the, where Jimmy Dore has gone in relationship to Eleven Nine, 
the Trump, Russia, Israel, Saudi, UAE operation uh, to basically not only install Trump, but then for the entirety of the political culture wars that are part and parcel of that and whatever Bannon's involvement is as part of this or CMP kind of uh, part of the operation. And basically, Jimmy Dore's minimized basically to the extent of never even really, as far as I know, actually interviewing any serious expert about the background of someone like Manafort in Ukraine. And these two obvious areas of sensitivity that Manafort had when he was on with Ben David was one is he named two of the oligarchs that he was involved in with, basically. He named uh, Deripaska and he named, I can't remember the other guy, but the key missing name, he refused to name, he always uh, kept him named as an oligarch, was Dim Dimitri Firtash, who is a crucial, as we've done in our long series of Deep Ukraine on the antidote, Firtash is the key, is the key oligarch, probably, who connects the Russian sphere of the 11-9 operation in through Europe and into the West. And as we pointed out when we were doing uh, uh, some of the stuff from uh, Putin's people, Catherine Belton, that the weaponization of gas flows and, and the monetization of gas flows in relationship to basically streamlining uh, political corruption via uh, fossil fuel uh, money into Ukraine, Dmitry Firtash was that guy on behalf of someone like Semyon Mogilevich, and thus Mogilevich also obviously a part of the Russian deep state in terms of uh, Putin as the Krisha, as we talked about this room. And there's, I cannot find anywhere where Jimmy Dore has actually had any discourse uh, in relationship to that part of Ukraine. Yeah, does the, I mean, does the name of Levich ever even pop up in the circles ever, or Lev Levaya, or... No, that's Levich. never been, no, neither of those names have ever been mentioned. And you would think that, like, with this idea, the, uh, one of the other things we talked about is, like, the idea of popular, the hijacking of populist politics, the weaponization of populist politics. And this is where, you know, we, our evolution in terms of our political understanding we continue to be populous, I would say. I, you know, we've uh, we've become more nuanced in relationship to what we see as weaponized talking points and meetings and stuff like that. But we agree with the populist revolt, and so this idea that like Jimmy Dore and the whole set would totally, uh, totally just not mention that there's this Mogilevich guy. He's the he's the Russian gangster of gangsters. He's the guy who basically owned Orban. He's the guy whose guy Firtash is in bed with Manafort in Ukraine in relationship to the uh, you know those earlier operations. And he was represented by a former head of the FBI. So if you're trying to uh, you know uh, criticize the obvious uh, to total corruption at the highest levels of the United States government. You would think you would mention this guy Mogilevich, who was represented by the former head of the FBI, who's now on the FBI's most wanted list again for ten million dollars, five million, or whatever. You're right. You know, I was thinking about this, Jeremy, when uh, just thinking about that that circus at the Republican National Convention yeah. with uh, Young Turks and Jimmy Dore and the whole at the time, Alex Jones and Roger Stone. How and uh, Rogers and like Jimmy Dore being like the most outraged, maybe along with Anna Kasparian, like where Shank Uger and Alex Jones, like you could almost see them kind of playing off of each other. Like with like a Jimmy Dore seemed to be like with maybe a little more like legitimate like uh, disgust, right? Um, it, uh, and now like I wonder like where does Jimmy Dore strongly differ from Roger Stone? Politically or in like terms of major issues. Now, I mean, there's we, 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 we talked about this, Jeremy. I mean, we, we talked about this. Like, of course, I mean, obviously, Jimmy Dore can't compare to the nastiness of Roger Stone in any way, shape, or form possible. I mean, I think there's probably very few people who can compare to the nastiness of Roger Stone. Yeah. And but we've talked about this. It's you know, uh, we've talked about how it doesn't always have to be the exact same thing being said. Like, there's different variations of a very um, similar, bigger narrative bigger being promoted to different audiences. And when I say like there's not much distance, uh, but the daylight, you know, quote Bibi Netanyahu, there will, <laughs> there will be no distance between <laughs> the U.S. and Israel under President oh, Trump. Um, there's very little, um, there's not a lot of uh, difference or daylight, so, or 
and that and that is and we we discussed this quite a bit when we were getting into like uh, true news a few years ago and even yes. bringing in uh, true news and Rick Wiles and the the Juku and even how like the, the differing narratives for different audiences and whereas um, I don't think you'll hear like the I mean there won't be like the over the top like Marjorie Taylor Greene like worship like that you'll get from like say Roger Stone no. and so forth. Yeah, but true, at the same true. time though when it comes to the COVID or like the the weaponization of the very real issues with uh, COVID. Or the uh, or elements of the manufactured culture war, and even in terms of like the, uh, the culture war, like Jimmy Dore, I don't think is going to do a going to do segments or rants about how um, you know the baby we're saving babies from being murdered by satanic pedophiles. No, that's not going to happen. But there is this not realm now. of well, ultimately the the problem is the liberal elites are the problem, and they're the real progressives who are going to stand against the pseudo progressive liberal elites that have. Uh, Put us into this problem with the combination of the fake uh, culture issues and the neoliberal economics and all this. And in a way, like it, not getting to the bottom of these events creates this strange bedfellows that a lot of people don't even realize exist in some ways. Where like yeah. people have seen, meanwhile, somebody who Jimmy Dore is publicly warmer with, than, say, a Roger Stone would be Tucker Carlson. And Tucker Carlson is probably is the. I mean, Tucker Carlson might be the most important to most. He might be the most influential media person. Our discourse right now because he brings in like the Fox News audience. He brings in the people that are too savvy or sophisticated that can see through the Hannity's and the other neocons at Fox News. But very much, I guess there's an extended, um, there's an extended like uh, similarity in terms of the bigger narratives being pushed through slightly different messaging for different audiences. Like it's a more progressive audience, so you're going to have differences in the particular things that are said, but it is the same bigger narrative with Rollin that um, the very much very similar narratives about the COVID tyranny combined with nothing happened in 2016 and it's all a witch hunt and we're just trying to say they just want to start a war if you believe anything wrong happened in the 2016 election. So obviously I think Tucker Carlson's the better direct comparison, but there's not really much difference between a between a Jimmy Dore and a Roger Stone politically at this point when it comes to the bigger issues where they're pretty much in lockstep on and they are once again it's not a perfect comparison but it's it's their respective audiences they're pushing a variation of the same message and it's a net it's a network too because I was just thinking of who was uh, Jimmy in an early hardcore stand for and I would point out that a lot of the networks that seem to surround him become fans are also Come, many of them actually come directly out of working for Tulsi Gabbard, who, of any of, of the alleged progressives, definitely of the Democrats, she's the one who is readily accepted on to Fox News. Yes. Oh, oh, no, no. She's even friendly with Sean Hannity, let alone Tucker Carlson. That reminds me of um, seeing Tulsi and Sean Hannity debate Ukraine. Like they, <laughs> they, they agreed to disagree while coming together on like uh, the, oh, the Biden ripping the MAGA, ultra MAGA is so horrible and uh, the, the Democrats are going to destroy our society. It's like, it's it's the, and Tulsi's like, I don't even know if she's not a leftist. Like she's, there's, I don't know, there's Tulsi's, I mean, there's something about Tulsi Gabbard that I don't think we're still quite figured out. I mean, there's got a, obviously got a very interesting, deep background with like the stuff in Hawaii combined with her military experience and all that. But I'm not specifically the, the, the Reichland network, the, the Ivan Reichland network that you really discovered as including Reichland, Tulsi Gabbard, Lindsey Graham, who else? Um, Ron DeSantis. Oh, oh, yeah. from, How can I forget I Darling know, Ron? Speaking yeah. of, uh, never the, uh, the Weinstein pushing yes. uh, Tulsi and uh, Dan Crenshaw. I don't yes. know Dan Crenshaw might have been part of that problem. That's a good As question. A veteran we, himself. We should look into that. And that then gets us to the question of Jimmy Dore misinforms about 9-11. Before uh, misinforming about 11-9, before 11-9 happens, Jimmy Dore was a 9-11 misinformer. Hardcore. And we even have a uh, uh, one of our shows when we dealt with like 11-9 uh, 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 truth. Do you remember, it was Donald Trump Jr. who led the way on Twitter about calling people uh, collusion truthers uh, and uh, as a derogatory, as, as, it was derogatory, right? And remember, like that, the show where we dealt with that, the uh, cover image of that, 
It was a Jimmy Dora show, you know, and it's since been taken down. I think maybe it was a private stream or something like that, where he was having to, he was being asked questions about 9/11, about the truth of 9/11, and basically his go-to line was. Noam Chomsky says, Noam Chomsky says 9-11 is a nothing burger, there's nothing there. Now, now and this was Jimmy Dore's line well before the 11-9 Trump, Putin, BB, NBC, NBS operation, but since then, there's now been a uh, COVID split between uh, uh, Jimmy Dore and Noam Chomsky. Jimmy Dore's on the right side of that split, right, right, I think, yeah. it's Noam Chomsky showed himself to be a biofascist a bio tyrannist who actually doesn't even understand the basics of COVID data in relationship to the nature of the vaccines. They don't really prevent uh, transmission at all. So it makes absolutely no, his Chomsky's COVID bio tyranny about basically, well, people aren't gonna get their vaccines and they can just be locked in their home and uh, we don't allow people to drive around without driver's license or while they're drunk because they can endanger us. And if they need to be fed, maybe they can get some prison food, uh, i.e., aka school food, uh, pushed under their door. But they can be get the sort of the uh, Shanghai treatment and be sort of locked inside their home. And Jimmy Dore at that point split. At this point, we still haven't heard that Jimmy Dore is split on the basic. Uh, with Chomsky, it's 9 11 disinformation, obviously. With Jimmy, I'd say it's. <laughs> and, and I would say that that's sort of, it's interesting that that take of Chomsky's, where Chomsky is obviously in the age of multimedia, where you can see basic physics on, on you know, on television, a recorded video from all kinds of angles, it's very obvious. Just go look at Robbie Martin, who's not willing to make the jump about the implications of who and why about the obvious demolitions of September 11th, but he knows in his gut from looking at basically an orange, that it's an orange and not an apple, which is very similar to what goes on in terms of Ground Zero and 9-11. So there's, an ob there's sort of an obscurantism basically in relationship to Chomsky's take on 9-11 that Jimmy Dore then com compounded that by an appeal to authority. He didn't even he didn't even go there with like the, the sort of the uh, the false uh, arguments of Chomsky. Basically, just appeal to the authority of Chomsky as the leftist. If there was something about 9/11 that the quote unquote liberal media was not telling us, Chomsky would have told us that. And this ties in obviously to, to Jimmy as an early and important Tulsi stand by uh, everybody who knew the basics of the fraudulent war on terror, the treasonous acts of September 11th, knew Tulsi Gabbard was a fraud. She was a fraudulent dove. She was not a dove. She was basically against uh, regime change war. She made it very clear. That's trademark now, basically, under Tulsi Gabbard. I'm against regime change wars. And as we pointed out over and over, if you actually read the documents that are crucial, such as the white paper, the clean break document, then Tulsi being, uh, you know, against the intervention in Syria would be actually, she's not against that war because that was not a regime change war. That was a rollback war as opposed to the Iraq war, which was laid out in the clean break paper as a regime change war. And so those of us who could see 9-11 at some macro level, clearly, in terms of the geopolitical motivations of who did it and why, even if we don't know exactly the forensics of every last thing, whether it's the sort of the backstory of all the intelligence and the hijackers and all that, or whether it's the the forensics of Ground Zero or the Pentagon and all that, the the being able to see that those buildings are not falling down. It's, that is obvious, Chomsky. You can go watch two seconds of video and know as a human with physical intuition that it's BS what, uh, what everybody, including Chomsky, is trying to tell you about it. And so we knew that, that Gabbard was actually a war on terror hawk. And she showed herself to be exactly that and more. She's also a 11-9 uh, disinformer. Like uh, like uh, Noam Chomsky is a 9/11 disinformer. Now I'm not going there with with Dor calling it misinformed because I don't have I don't actually have proof and I actually don't I actually don't believe that Dor is purposefully misinforming his audience. Around these things. But he is misinforming them.
and you, uh, you know, you brought, you brought me back to, to bringing about Tulsi and the, you know, she's a war on terror hawk, but she's against the regime change war, the whole paradigm of that. And we identified a few years ago how she had a very interesting fan base from uh, Shuli Botiak. I mean, she had spoken at the uh, Christians United for Israel event, Yes, I yes. Uh, the Adelsons. She, well, she's she's hanging out with the Adelsons. Herself. It's interesting that, like, she's a proponent. She, what, she's supposed to be so, she's supposed to be a serious opponent of, like, what's going on in Iran while she speaks at Christians United for Israel. I don't think Rand Paul's brazen enough to speak at Christians United for Israel. No, he just has ties. Rand Paul has ties in <laughs> yeah, the Christian United for Israel, 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 but he wouldn't have the chutzpah to go yeah. and like, no, hang out with the Adelsons like Tulsi Cabbard did. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you got Shmuley Botiak, you had uh, yeah, Steve Bannon was very... Oh. Yeah, okay. <laughs> All right, well, that was... Well, that's interesting. I didn't expect to run into a person who was familiar with our work here. Yeah, so that's... Uh, Different and uh, gentlemen wearing the Julian Assange shirt, at the very least, is uh, open to having a cordial discussion with those people. And uh, there's a lot of areas where we can find common ground now. Like we have our issues with Eva Bartlett as well, but yeah. I mean, there's areas where commonalities can be found. Them. But a lot of this goes back to this bigger, a lot of these I think, weaponized narratives that are out there. And I mean, there's a there's a Syrian angle that might be problematic with someone like Bartlett and a Russian angle. But I can also see where there could be value. I don't follow her work close, but I can see where there would be the areas where like we could agree with people. About certain aspects of the work, but then also have our critiques of it. So, well, in general, my the my sense of it, and this goes everywhere, including like aspects of Ryan Christensen and the Last American Vagabond and Libby Webb, for example, and it's related to like our criticism of the Abby and Robbie Martin is that they are highly skilled, and and it's in some areas they're like I would say they're a ten to a hundred x beyond us in terms of specific. Um, facts that they that they've dug up they've gone to the, on the ground they are learned in and i always break it down to this idea of the trivium that you can have facts then you got to have logic aka analysis and and then you have rhetoric and rhetoric then is the third turn where you then talk about strategies for communication which then gets into political policy you know uh, public politics and core politics and the way that you people and all that but the weakness I would say with the, the not only all these people including uh, Whitney Webb, Ryan Christensen, the Webb, I mean the, the Martins is the analysis side of things. The analysis is very weak I would say and very partial in relationship to this very specific set of facts that they know very very well but leave a lot out and of course you like the like uh, what was said to us when we first got here um, the, the women who took a picture of it from the uh, People's Party, um, that you can't um, cover everything. We know that. We're, yeah. we're, we're not, we, we know. There's a lot of things that we still want to cover that we haven't gotten yes. to. Yes. There's missing, there's like missing loops of like thing, topics that we said we were going to cover four yeah. years ago exactly. that are probably totally important to cover and that we haven't done it. You know, and so that's not the point. Uh, obviously, everyone picks and chooses who works in, uh, you know, in either analysis or journalism, what to focus on, what to choose. The, that's why the issue of the second step from trivium, of when you go from facts and grammar into logic and analysis, is really the key missing piece all around, I would say. Because the thing is that once you have an actually much more coherent analysis, then you can go back to the missing facts and know where to look. It doesn't prove facts. A lot of people reverse engineer their facts by their hypothesis, and you, that's not that, that's not scientific. It doesn't. It will often lead you astray. It'll lead you into uh, you know echo chambers of hearing what you want to hear factually. But if you do have a coherent analysis that you then test against reality, then it can point to areas of of facts and grammar that you are missing, or and then that, and that's a lot of what we do actually. It's not like we're actually, we're not journalists. We don't, we don't develop sources. We don't do digging in the archives and such like that. We read carefully. That's the main thing that we do, whether it's the media sphere, whether it's podcast sphere, or it's books, or it's articles. We just read carefully, not meaning like every single word, but we read for intent and we read for connections. And I believe it's this analytical framework that really is the major problem for these figures like the last American vagabond and the, the, and really what 
this again ties in then to Jimmy Dore's weakness, I'd say, on COVID, because that is so clear with the last American Vagabond and then Whitney Webb, too, in terms of I don't see a coherent, really truthful analysis about the, they downplayed the COVID threat and continue to do that to this day. And instead of focusing on what Whitney Webb did early on, which was the origins of the of the obvious lab-created uh, virus, which ne let's, we should not call it COVID, we should call it SARS. It is, it was originally SARS-2, we're now into SARS-3, basically, in relationship very likely to the mass vaccination campaign that's a driving uh, variant evolution very, very uh, rapidly. But that's just one example, I'd say, in terms of like the, this sort of whole milieu where, where the Jimmy Dore analytical network ties in with like the last American vagabonds, even Marlins and Whitney Webbs. And then to go back on pick up, uh, going back to Tulsa Gabbard, which we were talking about before, um, and you mentioned the Martins, and that brings up, uh, of course, we did the show about their, uh, their discussion of Abby Martin's time at RT on uh, yeah. Media Roots Radio, and uh, we haven't gotten a, uh, we <laughs> didn't get a reaction from, uh, from when Robbie Martin, I'm certain, is at least knows that it exists because, but at the very least, uh, he blocked, right? Yeah, yeah. On, on SoundCloud, yes. Um, I digress on that point, though. But uh, that, this goes back to our critiques of that when it comes even to like the whole Tulsi Gabbard picture. And what I was going to say before was uh, Tulsi Gabbard, we noticed about two or three years ago, he's a uh, strange fan. And we mentioned Shmuley Botian. <laughs> but then there's also Steve Bannon was a big fan of Tulsi Gabbard. He always had good things to say about her. David Duke was a fan of Tulsi <laughs> Gabbard and had good things to say about her. It all comes back to this foreign policy. And it's interesting, like, where Bannon obviously is, like, the Zionist, but, like, the anti-neocon, like, the, maybe a neo-neocon, he's an anti-neocon, he's the anti, like, forever war neocons or whatever, in this very weaponized way, while, meanwhile, bringing in the man who ran for president because he wanted to, because uh, the Iran deal was the greatest threat to the world, right? So it's, um, so she has these fans, and then more recently, uh, not only is she appearing, you mentioned Fox News, not only does she appear on Tucker Carlson's show, but she's appearing on Sean Hannity's show. And I made a parallel between uh, when he, these recent interviews. She's been on there a few times. She's been on there once to debate Sean about uh, <laughs> Ukraine. Because, uh, you know, because Sean, Sean Hannity takes the, I think, the potentially weaponized uh, role of the uber hawk or whatever, like saying the really irresponsible hawkish things about Putin and stuff. And I think there might be more to that than meets the eye. We've talked about that with, say, like, Lindsey Graham and all that. But <laughs> there's, there's more. Uh, there's, there's more than meets the eye to their hawkishness. But Hannity coming at it from like the, you know, Putin's a thug and all this in America, strong America's needed to. So there was a debate there, but then there's also in recent interviews, there's been points of agreement about the, um, the oh, the ultra MAGA comments by Biden are the worst, are the worst, and they're so irresponsible, and the don't say gay bill and all this, and, uh, make, and so there's, I, I got the vibes that you had identified when uh, Jason Goodman had Alan Dershowitz on his channel. And like this, almost like this horseshoe where like the, there's these disagreements on these certain <laughs> With Goodman and uh, Dershowitz, it was KC KCFD. Yeah. Kansas State Fire Department. Uh, but with the Dershowitz and Goodman, it was vaccines particularly. Like uh, Dershowitz pushing the, uh, you know, people need to get vaccinated and Goodman being against that. But then- Not only that people need to, that they can be forced to. Right, the, government, the yeah. debate of forced vaccinations or whatever. Or whatever. Not. But then, when it comes to Michael Flynn, like they're both about how Flynn is this persecuted good guy and all this. And so <laughs> I, I found a similar vibe between, and this this goes back to a lot of this conversation we're having here. Like, remember, like that'll be the justification for like uh, for Jimmy for uh, Jimmy Dore and Glenn Greenwald and people like that to associate with Tucker Carlson because there'll be people who will give a lot of like. Uh, and obviously, Hannity is even a different level than Carlson. I mean, Hannity is so obviously like just this. Uh, one of the worst of the worst when it comes to the warmongering, uh, media neocon. I mean, a key fixture in the Bush era and even now, obviously. And it's a little different brand than Tucker, obviously. There's the Tucker with the pseudo dubbishness and Hannity with like strong American, America number one. Uh, but it's funny how Tulsi kind of seamlessly uh, fits in with both of them. <laughs> but uh, the, and I, there's a point I was making. <laughs> I just lost my train of thought. Oh, I don't know about Tulsi. It was, it was uh, the specific role that Tulsi plays in relationship with it was one of her appearances on Hannity. Yeah, it was. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll get my train of thought back here in a second. This sometimes happens when you're winging it on the go, so. <laughs> but uh, the 
you've got the, 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 the difference, but then the it goes back to the conversation we're having with like the doors and the uh, the justifications that people will give. Like, you know, Glenn Greenwald will get a lot of pushback for going on Tucker Carlson's show or Laura Ingram's show. I don't think Glenn Greenwald's appeared on him like Tulsi Gabbard has. But he goes on Tucker and he goes on Laura Ingram and Laura Ingram's interesting because she's got her own little, uh, she's got her own little thing and uh, the different, the different pro Fox News prime time lineup. You've got Tucker the dub, right? The, uh, the MAGA dub. You've got, you've got Hannity the MAGA, the ultra MAGA uh, uh, hawk. And then you've got Laura Ingram who's like this hybrid of hawk and dub who was like basically mentored by David Horowitz network. And uh, is now, uh, she wrote books about how celebrities need to shut up and sing and stop protesting the Iraq war, but now presents herself as like an opponent of the forever wars or whatever. And so uh, their justification for that will be, well, Tucker or maybe Laura Ingram or whoever. Yeah, there's a lot of areas we disagree with them on, but they're the only platform that's giving people the opportunity to say these truths. It's the only platform that gives Jimmy Dore or Glenn Greenwald or Tulsi Gabbard the platform to speak the truth on these matters. So even if they are horribly wrong in some cases on things, or Tucker is really digging into like an ugly uh, underbelly of aspects of our society and weaponizing that in a way that the other like neocon media mouthpieces do not do that's okay because he's also the one giving the voice to these things and so even even tulsi gabbard like dis agreeing to disagree with sean hannity on aspects of U russia ukraine policy while they both continue to be dishonest about like the actual uh the installation and the reasons for like the installing of the previous president and how he was actually um if you're sean hannity he was going to properly, strongly deal with the Russians like a real president who wants America's national security interests at stake would. But then Tulsi Gabbard would be more of like maybe in the line of like, maybe there was something good about actually trying to pursue like some type of detente with the Russians or whatever. But it's still a, um, there's this agreeing to disagree in this very, I think, uh, ultimately meaningless way in a lot of ways. But then the coming together on the, uh, the combination of aspects of the COVID tyranny or, and it's not quite as pronounced with Dora, I don't think war aspect of it, but it's still there, but I think that this horseshoe maybe between Sean Hannity, Tucker Carlson, uh, and Tulsi Gabbard could be instructive, like what you identified with Jason Goodman and Alan Dershowitz a while back, and I think there's a similar yeah. angle going on here. Uh, yeah, like with Tulsi and Sean agreeing to disagree about the Iraq war. And they also, also, uh, they also, um, they also both wax poetic about how she joined the military because of September. Yeah, that that was again. You get you get back to like Obama and <laughs> referencing the CFR uh, head. What's his name? Richard Haas. Richard Haas's book, uh, Wars of Choice, Wars of Necessity, and reinstantiating that whole uh, falsehood. Basically, uh, Afghanistan was the good war. The war on terror is the right one because Al Qaeda attacked us from there. And remember, it, it plays into all of the the kinds of stuff that we saw Max Grunewald do as he made his switch yes. in Syria. Where Still he... unexplained switch, by the way. Blumenthal going from uh, helping his father, basically, promote Hillary Clinton's uh, State Department policy in Libya and Syria, and, um, and then uh, ridiculing George Galloway for being a Assad apologist or whatever, to going to the RT 10th anniversary dinner and setting up the gray zone and Ben North and deleting years worth of blogs about how terrible and how much of a dictator Assad was. Was and Max at the at the uh, the anniversary dinner? I believe where he was with at Flynn yeah, and, it was, yeah, he was. But he uh, was at a different table, or maybe he I, wasn't at that dinner. He the, wasn't invited to that he dinner. He was there. I thought that, I thought Blumenthal was in the picture. I'll have to look at the picture again because I know I know uh, maybe he wasn't. I don't want to. I don't want to miss. I don't. Is wanna, that the same miss, event that he was on the panel with? Uh, I believe Bowsman. that's where that would have came from <laughs> about winning the info award. I think that might have been part of that whole event. And by the way, I've not found the. I thought I had the access to the full video of that a while ago, but I haven't been able to find it since. But, uh, uh, there, but point made, whether Blumenthal was in the picture or not, my my uh, it escapes me at this point whether he was or not. I don't want to get that information wrong about that. It may have said that before, and if it is the case, then we'll have to correct that in the future if he was involved at the, at the dinner table or not. Well, we know for sure he has not explained the exactly. nature of his turn yes. in Syria. And the main thing is that we see the way in which the culture war combined with the terror war, the 
those are the twin pillars of the destruction of core politics, both in America and abroad. I mean, you know, and so the the the, the turn of Blumenthal in Syria, where he then embraces the sort of the remember the book, the management of savagery, yes. and all of that. Then it, that seems to play right along with the specific way that Tulsi Gabbard, maybe of almost anybody, of any politician at least, fuses in a very toxic fashion the terror war with the culture war in the way that she describes basically Islam, it seems like, in general. And Blumenthal went this line of sort of like the savages and all of that. And Russia is obviously on the good side of yeah. the management of savagery because they're killing the savages. Yeah, the West, the West created the created the savages that are that are carrying out all this chaos and on one hand like it's it, I don't know I mean I, I I think he still presents himself as like a, as somebody who stands against like the wars of Islamophobia and all this although he was way more pronounced about that back when you had your run in with him during the early days of the Obama administration and there's a difference even here like a Tulsi Gabbard like is a little more maybe overtly on aspects of like yeah. the controlled right side in terms of the culture war, but like Max Blumenthal was like writing books about the uh, what was the book American Gomorrah, Amer uh, Republican Gomorrah, Republican Gomorrah, yeah. getting into the Council for National Policy, interestingly enough. Yeah. And then a couple of years ago, Max Blumenthal got access to a CNP meeting, and he managed to get a he managed to get the uh, audio, uh, or he managed to uh, get a transcript of uh, the of one of the convenient Russia overt. Talks in this very similar way to Sean Hannity, Nikki Haley. Oh yeah, got her speech. She didn't get any of the Russia Dove speeches <laughs> from the CNP. But that's <laughs> that's interesting. That's interesting. So the CNP is just the CFR for Republicans. Yeah, and that's the, and as uh, John Brisson and uh, Josh Reeves have correctly pointed out, the when Alex Jones was making all the documentaries exposing the trilateral commission <laughs> of the Bilderberg Group and martial law and the United Nations and. A lot of that, some some of it, some of it legitimate, some of yeah. it very, 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 very weaponized and exaggerated. The other side of this was never adequately um, uh, exposed either by the Alex Jones side or by the what you might call the responsible side. And of course, once again, like these problems here, like uh, are once again you have that void of quote unquote responsible actors in our society, and there's, there's an aspect of the. I think there's an aspect of the Jimmy Dore narratives that play off of the refusal of the supposed the authorities of these supposedly were supposed to be the responsible elements in our society to do what they're supposed to do and bring truth to power. Therefore, these these issues I think both get uh, but this has been going on for decades. Like, this has been yeah. going on for a long, long time, and I think it's taken us a while to understand this to yeah. the level that we do now. But the um, the the hole that's left in terms of like being honest leaves the door open for both the valid and the invalid weaponized uh, capitalizing off of the void left with those narratives. And so both the like the, the better stuff that Jimmy Dore does and a lot of the worst stuff that he does and other people are both I think a direct consequence of the void that has been left in terms of trying to expose what's really going on in our country and our world by the people who are supposed to be the responsible actors and the kind of people now who are going to uh, Respond to the escalation, this weaponized escalation of the culture war by playing right into it while also uh, may, maybe, I don't know all the ins and outs and dynamics of it, uh, setting up, or at least a very badly named like disinformation panel or whatever. Once again, instead of like trying to speak truth to power, you're going to try to like at least put the illusion out there, the impression out there that you're going to punish the people who are speaking truth to power. So it plays right back into the hands of this. But a lot of this, and once again, this goes back to Jimmy Dore taking Noam Chomsky as the authoritative figure <laughs> to tell us what really happened on September 11th, that the uh, perfect example there of uh, uh, Chomsky's a different type of like authority than what we're describing here. But the, I guess this would be the appeal to authority that Jimmy Dore can't say CNN is right about September 11th. So he says, no, Chomsky is right about September 11th. Uh -huh. <laughs> it, it would be a little different. Chomsky would say it's, oh, it's blowback. And Rod Paul, blowback, and, and all that. And, uh, <laughs> Giuliani ro mocking Rod Paul for saying it was blowback while the direct 9-11 complicitor gets off on stage at the Republican debate, the debate that actually made me support Rod Paul back all those years ago. <laughs> but... Um, Man, once again, I lose my train of thought a little bit here. Guess we're just having fun out here, just uh, yeah. doing the stream. I hope it's I hope it's informative. It's uh, just we're off the cuff here. We didn't play any of this. We're just discussing, uh, getting into a more wide ranging media analysis discussion again with the uh, with Jimmy Dore out here. But I remember now what it was. It was the 
uh, Chomsky is a different type of authority, I guess, uh, but the uh, deferring to an authority, while also Chomsky uh, capitalizes off of the, uh, the inability to inform, and Chomsky can take the official The narrative. corruption of the authoritative sources at some level. And take a, an element of a population by question something like this and bring them into the official narrative. Both on it's interestingly enough, we mentioned Kennedy before and September 11th, those issues of our time. And interestingly, somebody mentioned uh, James Corbett, and Corbett has been accurate about Chomsky and uh, yeah. JFK and September 11th. And then James Corbett went and ruined pretty much any credibility he had with me with that stupid video he made comparing Russia Gate to his 9 11 conspiracy theory. Video. Ja James Corbett's 11 9 uh, or Trump, or, he should have called it 11 9 a conspiracy. Theory, but he didn't right. because he hasn't researched it enough. And so basically, his uh, you know Trump Russia conspiracy uh, a conspiracy was a nothing burger itself. His video it was basically serving the uh, the coup plotters line. Whereas his 9/11 Corbett's 9/11 uh, the best five minute I think the best five minutes on just totally uh, disgracing the. Conspiracy theory as totally fraudulent. It's the it's one of the best. It's just quick and it's right on target. And it doesn't say who did it and why. Again, this is a sort of you know this is another area I would call this related or parallel to this whole idea that you've been exploring about the nature of the vacuum. When you have uh, when you have authoritative the idea of authoritative sources, right? Now there's a reason that there's an idea of authority that should be respected. Authority is earned, whether it's in political leadership or whether it's in intellectual co contribution. Authority comes from you've done your work, you've done, you've done uh, uh, deep diving into a bunch of your sourcing, you've uh, thought through things, you've uh, made good hypotheses, your uh, theories have proven out, your research has proven out. So that's how you gain uh, authority rather than an appeal to the authority. But in the vacuum of the actual authority, that's when you have like the, this whole uh, you know area where uh, people then come in and uh, uh, weaponize uh, all of that. And now it's um, there were a few years ago there was a phrase that was coined, and it might not have been the best phrase for it. I'm not sure if I would use this phrase going forward. Something called the Red Brown Alliance. And regardless, and there were there were there were even issues with that element of. Um, uh, line of thinking and inquiry. I mean, uh, maybe some of the people who were responsible for putting it out there, and then also like this, also this false portrayal of like the uh, of the maybe the more um, like holding up like the corrupt American establishment as like the bastion of like uh, righteousness and all this. There's an element of that in the thinking, but and. We could, we could, that's one, speaking of never doing everything, we never fully got into that like we wanted to. So, I mean, nobody can do everything. If you expect someone to do everything, then you'll never be satisfied. But, um, I digress, but, uh, the, oh, the I, Red Brown oh, Alliance. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Okay, I, I, I missed a piece of my last thought that was uh, comparing what you've been talking about, about the vacuum that Chomsky steps into, and then Door then piggybacks on top of this Chomsky as the new sort of anti-authority or the dissident authority. That uh, that someone like um, uh, Corbett, in relationship to even 9/11, how good his quick debunking video was. When you have a vacuum of an analysis of who and why around these deep events, that would go anywhere from the serial uh, murders of the Kennedys, like <laughs> like that guy I was talking about. That was a good way of talking about it. Or when you talk about something like September 11th or COVID, I would say too. Then you then have another vacuum when you don't when you just stay either in forensics sort of uh, sort of endless forensics uh, and or if you get into just sort of you know not uh, doing any analysis of who did it and why then you create a vacuum in which then uh, you know the weaponization of the conspiracy theory uh, can 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 happen too and um, what uh, this term red brown alliance I think. Um, the, and I think now there's also in 2022 there's more knowledge. There's more. You've seen more than what was going on in 2018 when this was first being identified. Um, I believe it was a, uh, some, I believe it was a professor by the name of Alex Reed Ross that was really uh, that was at the forefront of putting this out there. And there's problems with that as well. But then there's also there's there's it's like with so much there's nuance, there's shades of gray. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's good and there's bad. But I think that in this case, like the 
the positive aspects of it that should be focused on by people that should that should be willing to focus on are not focused on while the uh, obviously the blind spots and issues are, are still there too I'm sure but um, and I would just point out that I think Alexander Reed Ross was more perceptive and ana analytically correct even though he didn't know quite how to make the case at the time about Kevin Barrett specifically. <laughs> and, I mean, that's something we've had to, uh, man, I don't, yeah, that's like, I we've mean, had to evolve there um, too. Yeah, there's a lot of problems there. A lot of problems there. I'm sure we'll talk more about going forward, but I mean, it's just uh, Dinesh just being promoted as a, as a bastion of truth on Pulse Flag Weekly. 2,000, 2 million drools. Have you seen and, the uh, latest live stream? I guess, 2, um, 2 million drools. Uh, Cat McGuire and the settlers in Israel that uh, Dinesh D'Souza is going to entertain later this year with uh, Sebastian Gorka. Oh yeah, to stand with Israel tour can agree on that. I'm sure they're telling the whole truth about the uh, their documentary about the. Uh, remember, this is actually just a we're we're back in 2016 land. Remember the the three million illegals voting. Yeah. You've the guy the, the you remember I pointed out that there was only one person it looked like in the entire country who would actually make that claim. And then there was only one person who would actually back up Trump uh, on uh, mainstream television about the claim of three million illegals voting in, uh, in uh, 2016. Remember, that was all about Trump wanting to have won the, po the popular vote. That was really, that was the main service of, and the only guy who actually would do that on TV was Chris Kobach, who then was put on the election integrity panel. This 2000 Mules, the two million drools movie, is just a, uh, a 2022 remix of the 20, of the 2016 three million illegals voted and the election integrity panel featuring ESNS boy, Chris Kobach. <laughs> So that's what that's what passes for. Meanwhile, uh, Sarah Kinzier's upcoming book, mm. is what looks look like what looks like is going to be a critical evaluation of conspiracy culture in America. Um, and get any and by co by conspiracy culture <laughs> very specifically. Oh, where were we? we were on Dinesh D'Souza and oh, yeah. 2,000 Mules and uh, but Sarah Kinzier's uh, oh, yeah. book. The culture, the culture of conspiracy. And what's really cool about it is she's playing on the weaponization of the language even yeah. of the idea where you, everybody knows the background of conspiracy theory as weaponized language but then people are more and more aware of actual conspiracy theory culture as having obviously been weaponized in relationship to the most obvious thing is like Trump, Alex Jones, uh, QAnon, all of that kind of uh, stuff. But then what, what Sarah Kenzier is doing which looks very interesting now, of course, I don't expect she's going to go, quote unquote, all the way with 9-11, but I also get a sense she's going to resurrect 9-11 as a legitimate area of controversy or inquiry. Uh, along with her being one of the leading 11-9 truthers, yes. we might call 11-9 conspiracy theorists. And last thing is that she's playing on this idea of that it's not only a culture of conspiracy theory that's been a vacuum weaponized, but it's also a political culture of powerful yes. conspirators going unchecked. And like, that's a problem. And um, I, I'm gonna, we'll talk more about this closer to when the book actually comes out and all that. We'll have, I'm sure we'll have a lot to say about this topic uh, as it's going to be a, a major one going forward, I think, especially if, this, if there's an opening here to, like, one of the most serious um, audiences of, like, political activists that are out there in terms of her audience. But um, a couple things about that. Uh, number, it is interesting that, like, her, her inroads to, like, MSNBC is Joy Reid, who herself has a background of what blogs about 9-11 truth and all this. And uh, and so it makes me wonder what those conversations are like off camera or whatever. <laughs> but, uh, uh, but that won't get the play on, on False Flag Weekly News that uh, 2,000 Mule by Dinesh I'm going to go, uh, I'm sponsoring a Stand with Israel uh, tour with, with Dr. Sebastian, Sebastian Gorka. Gorka where we're going to take a bunch of gullible evangelicals over to Israel, right, and tell them about their, their holy land roots and all this, right? And uh, <laughs> But meanwhile, like somebody who's actually critical of the, uh, who's actually been more more vocal about bringing the central role, of, the, the major role of Israel in the 2016 uh, election, 11-9 operation, won't get that playtime because they're seen as like a deep state shill or whatever, or completely unfamiliar with the work that's being done there. So we'll have a lot more to say about Or that, that the new, uh, the new uh, White House uh, press spokeswoman is anti-APAC. 
Like, you're not going to see that. As well, a... you Michael Jones probably wouldn't have very good things to say about no, that. No, 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 that's true. <laughs> Mr. Mr. Culture War magazine. There's that term, culture war. Culture war, war yeah. yeah. The endless culture wars. So in general, that is an area, I think, where we really see that there's a lot of possibility. And I think it was being proven out just recording this here, where people who are you know, going to go out of their way to go uh, uh, you know, pay to see a Jimmy Dore show here in North Kansas City are one person is aware of some of the depths of our work and appreciates that we're out there, even with a clear, you know, calling Jimmy Dore a misinformer as they're going in, but then also someone who's tied into Whitney Webb and yeah. Last American Vagabond and stuff like that. When you get into an actual sort of open political conversation, you can begin to break the culture war down. And so uh, that's one thing that I think that, that you know, Yes, there needs to be very overt uh, political conversations and organizing, and I really think there's a place right now for a new um, alliance, you know, a neither nor of the neo-libertarian, neo-conservative alliance, or the quote-unquote red-brown alliance, just as we're neither nor on the unipolar versus the multipolar world. Say no to Adam, say no to Kinzinger, Cheney, and, say no to Kinzinger, Cheney, Green, and Kitchen. And go sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Although it is interesting that kids when you're talking about the U.S. Israel relationship and future aid in terms of yeah. like, pitches on Ukraine and all that. And by the way, Biden's going to Holy Land next month. That's going to be very, very interesting. Which is very inter interesting. And this Al Jazeera Palestinian American woman reporter who's been reporting like from the front lines of the assault on Palestine by the Israelis for decades, I think, actually. Years and years and years and years and years. And she's like the voice of some of the next generation who's coming up in Palestine. They remember her covering their, you know, their neighborhoods when they were children. And she was targeted for assassination is what it really looks like. She was shot directly in, the, in her head. She had a bulletproof vest on. And, and you can see a little bit of who's who even in terms of the mainstream media. Look at the difference between the headline on the New York Times versus the Washington Post. Actually, that's a very interesting differential. New York Times is their basic disinformation, passive tense disinformation about she died from uh, 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 being a, a blow, a shot to the head, uh, from being shot, from being shot. Uh, don't investigate who did it and why or anything like that. Washington Post, on the other hand, basically went on the ground. Robbed on the Potomac. <laughs> <laughs> and they went on the ground, it looks like, and they, uh, they, by the way, it was a journalist with other journalists. You would think there would be some kind of Khashoggi kind of scenario too going on here, right? Remember when Khashoggi, the Washington Post journalist, was targeted for uh, bone saw mafia assassination uh, and it looked like probably Kushner helped facilitate it, Trump uh, probably rubber-stamped it, uh, and all of that. And, and Putin probably agreed in the background as well, evidenced by that. Uh, the high five! No, no, no! Let's, all right, here's, Pu here's Putin and MBS going to the G20, was it? Or the G yeah, yeah, I think the G20. So. Yeah. I think this is within, like, wasn't this within, like, a month of the, uh, within a couple months of the Khashoggi? Uh, yeah, it was, like, the first big uh, geopolitical meeting after the Khashoggi assassination, it was just like, yeah, <laughs> but it's okay. like little boys, but imagine yeah. if, uh, imagine, you know, it's, it, but that's, it's okay for him to do that. It's okay for him to visit with Benjamin Netanyahu over a dozen times in four years. Whereas if uh, a Democratic leader did it even once, they're going to have their head bit off rhetorically for doing it. It's yeah. like, but it's okay with Putin, because they're managing, they're, it's all, it's all, they're keeping, they're keeping Israel in control, you see, so it's okay, it's all good. I mean, we, I get, I, I get furious talking about that more and more as time goes on. But, um, yeah, we're just, we're and then, of course, Biden comes in and basically does the uh, Obama Act on it, as Obama sort of helped the Saudis with their war on Yemen. Biden comes in and makes a little bit of noise about the Saudis and Khashoggi. Well, his obvious and it's soothing the whole, uh, praising the Abraham yep, Accords. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. But at the same time, there's something going on. Oh, we'll definitely. break it down more and we'll talk a little bit about there's there's some things going on here. And even going back to the Washington Post, I mean, like, obviously the Washington Post is a problem, but I think it goes even back, more back in terms of, like, the actual, like, institutions that want to uphold, like, a corrupt, but actual, like, hold up, like, an American system, nonetheless, a corrupt American system. But they're not, the Washington Post isn't out to see, like, the complete, uh, 
destruction of like the system the way ba basically not going to hand the keys of the corrupt to, right. to quote unquote solve the american problem yeah. you know or the or to, to help the cor american corrupt system handing the keys over to uh bb and putin yeah. and I mbz mean, and mbs and a lot of people say like i think the, the washington post is kind of described as the intelligence paper right like, right and the, the, the organ of the cia and of course yeah. you go back to the Meyer graham empire yeah. and uh ben bradley was Posthumously, I think in a movie portrayed as like this great hero and like what came out of that just a bunch of cover-ups and like that Obviously, this is all going on during the height of like the uh, the aftermath of the Kennedy years when the some of the investigations were going on Obviously, obviously that's a problem. We're not gonna sit here and sing the praises of the Washington Post But at the same time like there's remember just how remember like uh, It might be remember how like, you've well, identified like you know Maggie Haberman's at the New York Times and all. This. Meanwhile, you've identified like New York Times is almost more of like a Benet Brith maybe mouthpiece as opposed to uh, the Washington Post is like the intelligence service mouthpiece. And you think about like Trump had this art, very similar to CNN kind of this artificial rivalry with the, yeah. the fake news New York yeah. Times. Yeah, 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 like yeah. Maggie Haberman's doing his uh, doing his yeoman's work for him. Or you Maggie Haberman's following <laughs> on the next generation of her mother's work oh, as a, a PR meister for Rudy Giuliani and Donald Trump, right? right? <laughs> but think about just how, in addition, like the Khashoggi we had in uh, the, the uh, dismemberment, you have the, obviously, the targeting of Bezos. You can say whatever you want about him as like this, uh, I mean, there's, I mean, obviously another problem. I mean, in terms of like the ridiculous wealth and so many aspects, there's a problem, obviously. Yeah. And that's, that might the be, Amazon might totalitarianism. That, that might be called the quintessential quote-unquote American. Yeah, definitely. I mean, in terms of like Amazon running the, the CIA clouds and all of that, it's, yeah. And so there's obviously big issues there. And so the Washington Post, democracy dies in the dark. The Washington Post are not going to really be the ones to like shine the light, but they're not going to be the ones killing you in the dark like uh, the Bonesaw Mafia will actually be killing Khashoggi, potentially. Maybe that was probably actually in, under full lights, actually. Yeah. But this this assassination of the Al Jazeera journalist, Shireen, I can't remember her last name, I think this is a very, very important um, uh, assassination to uncover and to uh, point out. And it is the case that the Washington Post did some real journalism, and they went and actually talked to journalists. They did some basics of journalism investigation, and they write an, uh, a headline that basically said that she was killed by Israeli forces, is what it said. Now, my sense is, Greg and I have an, you know, are beginning to discuss that I brought up the idea that every time that, that Biden, for first of all himself, when he was vice president, was met by Israeli pro provocations when he was about to show up in Israel to put a little bit of uh, you know lip service pressure on the occupied the Israeli occupation uh, operations. Now th this looks sort of similar to that, but you then began talking, Greg, about how we begun discussing last year in relationship to the Gaza pro provocations, which were run directly out of Netanyahu's office in relationship specifically to East Jerusalem, that th there was a, that was a, a political destabilization operation in addition to the regular, uh, uh, you know, mass murder and war crimes of the Israeli out, government against the Palestinians. Turns out both Israel and Russia, I mean, Russia a year later carried out operations in the aftermath of this administration coming in. I mean, like, it's it's interesting, like, yeah, you know, Russia one year later, oh, right. Israel within months. I mean, it's, uh, it's, right. it's, it's very interesting. That's, a, that's interesting also. I never thought about the, the Russia timing in relationship to the Israel timing that 2021 comes and Israel, quote unquote, mows the lawn again. But it really was Netanyahu in that case who provocateured that. And so we begun to talk about how there, you know, Bennett, of course, goes and does, does basically, it's, I think it's war criminal speech that Bennett is doing in terms of he's obviously covering up the assassination of a journalist by uh, Israeli forces and he goes in there and starts muddying the water about how it was uh, these Palestinian militants and the, none of the video works out. It's very obvious the journalists who were there basically saw the Israelis uh, shoot, shoot her in the head. And, and what it looks like to me, there's um, a journalist who operates out of Montreal, New York, and Tel Aviv, and she's a national security journalist in Israel. 
and she seems to have a line in in relationship to certain sources inside of Israel and they told her that none of the Israeli snipers had discharged rounds but that a special forces unit was 150 meters away from the assassinated journalist and and I pointed out to Greg that that if this were to have been some kind of uh, even potentially an internal Israeli coup faction on top of the regular structural Israeli war crimes against the Palestinians and journalists obviously how many journalists have the Israelis killed 50 journalists at least at the very least I think just in the 21st century um, and this being a Palestinian American woman journalist who's covered the, the, those areas for years and years and years and, and years this is a very clear assault not only obviously on her, her family, on the Palestinian people, but also on the American uh, people and the American polity in terms of the the, the uh, level of that kind of attack, but also potentially in Israeli de destabilization coup faction. Yes. And we, we were talking about how that if these kinds of things happen in the United States, it's very often we look towards like the Flynn, the, spe the, the sort of like uh, seditious, treasonous type forces that are, are that have infiltrated special forces. And this is what Bibi Netanyahu is. He's a seditious, treasonous uh, special forces operator inside of the Israeli uh, system who has a back channel to Putin. And so we notice that like Bennett and Lapid, it's a very shaky kind of coalition in many ways, right? It also included a Lieberman yeah. coming in there <laughs> who seems to also be the doorway to the re-destabilization of it. And so if there's anyone who I think would have done it, I believe that this source is actually correct from the Israeli security side, that it wasn't the regular Israeli snipers set, it was a special forces unit, and it was a special operation. And it was designed not only to assassinate this journalist and get rid of her, and it was meant as a, a very blatant kind of message to the world's uh, information people and journalists, but also as a direct provocation to the United States government, to the Biden administration, but also potentially a domestic destabilization operation. Because people who are trying to defend the Israelis, they don't have forensics, but they have qui bono, basically saying, how does this serve uh, Bennett? And how does this serve the Israelis to do something this this level of, uh, of prov provocation in terms of directly assassin kill shot in a journalist in the head? Uh, an, an American, a Palestinian American woman journalist directly in the head. It doesn't make sense in terms of Israeli, like, sort of mainstream global PR uh, interests, but it does make sense as a deep state kind of, of message to the world's journalists, a provocation against the United States, and intensely, I would suspect, Netanyahu. Netanyahu, Lieberman, those destabilizing factions that are that are meant to want to disrupt this Bennett Lapid kind of footsie playing with the West kind of scenario where they're not all in with Russia on the Ukraine quote unquote special operation. Remember, the Ukrainian invasion, the war on Ukraine by Russia is not even called a war. It's called a special call operation. It's, it's not, not allowed war. to say this because it's pro provoking World War Three, according to <laughs> Jimmy Dore, <laughs> Tulsi Gabbard, Max Blumenthal. Keep naming them. Yeah. Um, Kevin Barrett. Cat uh, McGuire. Cat McGuire. Uh, Tucker Carlson. Tucker Carlson. And then you get the pseudo hawks, the, the, the fake, the, I, I think the, in some ways, maybe fake saber rattling hawks who are, I'll use this as an excuse to, ah, the loony left won't let us open up our energy energy capacities to have free reign over being a number one energy producer again. That's how you punish Putin, is by, is by um, creating more energy and more oil, more, more of this, more of this, more fracking, more, more pipelines, more, 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 and it's, it's a, it's a mess all around, if you ask me, but, uh, and then, once again, this will be something we'll have to tackle on in the future, though, Lindsey Graham, maybe being the new John McCain, maybe that's still <laughs> yeah, true in more yeah, ways yes, than one, I, yes. that's not, I don't know if we want to get into that right now, but yeah. that'll be something to discuss, like, maybe in more ways than one, Lindsey Graham is the new John McCain, and maybe he didn't just stop being the new John McCain after he joined up with Trump. <laughs> 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 and McCain was on the old Adair Pasca yacht, apparently, yeah, as Steve Schmidt is. Very interesting. Yeah, yeah. Now the, the rats are uh, definitely leaving the ship and biting at the ankles of the Megan McCain's at this point. But one thing, I, another thing I wanted to point out, specifically about Jimmy Dore 11-9 specifically, that the, the kind of, 
you know, Jimmy Dore is different. He's not he's not Russian state sponsored media. Like like we also studied the actual RT and Sputnik, which is very obvious. They're actually state sponsored. They're part of the state sponsored information uh, platform. And and as um, Simonian said, as we quoted her from the uh, the National Intelligence Review after 2016 that made Abby so angry. And I understand partially why Abby was so angry about it, but she should have read a little bit more of it. She should have read the fullness of that document, actually. She should have John Brisson the thing a little bit, you know, and gotten to the points of the actual quotes from Simonian RT herself, basically saying, when war starts, remember, 2016, it's a hybrid war. It's a, it's a, it's a Sirkovian, it's a Gerasimovian, kind of uh, operation in the United States in terms of the Russian component to it. So war was engaged. It was political warfare in 2016. And at that point, Simonian says that you, a media platform of the state is part of the war effort. Everybody knows that. That wouldn't be controversial if it was Voice of America and during the uh, you know NATO bombing in Belgrade and all that. You know, it wouldn't be controversial if it was Israel today operating in a manner like True. <laughs> Although, how would yeah? <laughs> that's that's true. So this one part, this other piece of eleven nine and the cover up of the eleven nine operation in relationship to Jimmy Dore is Epstein and Trump, and I, I've definitely seen that he will not go there. And actually, I've seen Jimmy, Jimmy Dore seems nervous around the entirety of the Epstein Maxwell uh, analysis. It's so obvious a key piece of politics. Again, if he's really like serious anti-American establishment, as I pointed out to their faces, to the, the Trump and Clinton New York Times. By the way, the guy on the panel from the New York Times at that Dole Institute event where I called out the uh, entire range of the political operatives from Republicans and Democrats to the journalists about not giving the American people the information about how both Trump and Clinton were the most compromised apparently by the Epstein Maxwell foreign intelligence operation. The, the New York Times guy is the guy, I think, who uh, just published the, uh, the book that had the uh, recording up from uh, Mark Meadows oh. a, a year or two later, whatever it was. That was the guy from the New York Times, uh, one of the co-authors. So did that. he sit on that for a long time, like Bob? Yeah, Hubert? yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and by the way, uh, I believe, and Jimmy Dore, uh, this is the thing that I want to cover, is I feel like he, his coverage of the uh, press correspondence dinner uh, was very, it was not productive, it was not fair, it was not comprehensive. He made some good critical points about Trevor Noah sort of playing the sort of comfortable, sort of liberal establishment court jester in certain ways, but he left out these kinds of key pieces where he, for some reason, he did not mention, I don't believe, in his analysis of Trevor Noah's uh, uh, roast. Just the deep state shill. Yeah, who mentioned f first and foremost about, uh, you know, the, we're here with all of the um, politicians and the media bigwigs and the celebrities and all these wealthy people, a.k.a. all the people who are Jeffrey Epstein's island. That's how we started the thing. <laughs> Jimmy Dore didn't say a word about that. Uh, that was a little, that was some interesting... Uh, you know, it was uncomfortable. He called it out as a super spreader event to start with. He talked about, I'm sure everybody's happy to be here except uh, the the men, uh, who, some of the, the men who are happy that uh, Ronan Farrow is not here. You know, I mean, there was a lot there. And be, remember, he, Trevor Noah, in doing so, bridged the gap that we've done an analysis of that we believe was engineered in relation to watch this. Oh yeah, it's it's very interesting. I mean, Jimmy Dore's critical analysis of it is correct in part in terms of the the way that they sort of made a joke of uh, Trevor Noah points out that uh, uh, you know pre uh, President Biden, as you've come in, it looks like everything's going up, oil's going up, gas prices are going up, inflation <laughs> is going up, up, you know, all of that. So and they and then Biden laughed at it and stuff like that and. Before I forget, this is another basic difference, I mean, between even, like, Trump and other politicians, is that, like, Trump was so thin-skinned that he wouldn't let anybody make fun of him at the, uh, no. the correspondence dinner, so he boycotted it. 
And once again, like, it may not seem like a big deal, but it goes back to things like we've talked about, like even like the psychological nature of somebody like Trump that makes, maybe makes him tick the way he does, that made him so much different and more damaging than other people in the position. I mean, that's just a small detail, but it's like, I think it's valid. Yeah, at the very, our very first analysis of Trump was he was a very unstable asset, but he was all, over time, we've un, begun to understand more and more what a dangerous yeah. asset he was. And even, you know, the, these, the, the Esper revelations, you know, obviously later, too late, a year too late, but still they're there and they have to be taken seriously right. in terms of what Trump was actually planning on doing, wanted to do in terms of using U.S. military against uh, uh, protesters yeah. in D.C. And, and then including sort of big provocative actions potentially that we were really worried about in the transition. Well, I had the uh, great displeasure of listening to War Room, uh, <laughs> War Room Battleground, as it's now called, no longer called War Room Pandemic, with uh, Steve Bannon interviewing Commander Eric Brighton, who might be my future senator here making Missouri one of the uh, worst places in terms of like Holly and Greitens, if that happens. Uh, it's, uh, that but, could be uh, up there. Singing the praises of Commander Greitens as a man who the deep state hates because he gets things done and he, and he tells it like it is. And uh, Mark Esper simply, oh, just crediting Esper because he simply represents the uni, what was it, the, uh, the uniparty neocon lobbyists who wanted to keep the endless wars going. And they claim that Trump is the one trying to do all these provocative escalations when in reality he's just a lobbyist and he doesn't need to be listened to. But it's interesting, like, I look at this as like, this is later, later, I mean, this very much, I think, lends credence to things we were concerned about. Yes. And a lot of the worst things did not happen, maybe not by lack of effort with in terms of what January right. 6th could have potentially been, right. but because, like, you know, things we warned about, like, but and the, also the replacement things, of the nucle National Nuclear Security yeah, yes. Administration. And those, that was the first act. And those things that were warned about, like, they don't go away either just because Trump's out of power. I mean, no, they're still there. And as long as these networks are not rooted out, they're going to continue to be there. And so, the, I, you know... The same is true with uh, Netanyahu, if this is the case with the Netanyahu Network. Right. And so I, I, I get I sort of like I'm becoming to some like closing thoughts in a way of like the arc of this moment and including the sort of the problems of Jimmy Dore, but also the, the certain benefits of uh, at the very least his audience and his milieu to the political conversation and what really needs to happen right now. And so I just want to just like point out that there this is we need there need to be the bridging these divides and filling the vacuum with not just endless facts and all of that but really like uh, rhetorically persuasive logical analysis uh, not only the nature of our problems as w as wide and deep as we can but also beginning to move towards solutions and i continue to believe that our main stumbling block is not we have basically i i believe that like I at least have a handle on enough of the kinds of policy implementations that could be done at the different scales of our of our governmental system to to really I think we can solve a lot of our physical and economic uh, and ecological problems at this point are the main question I have and my main source of concern and my uh, my unease in this moment, especially, is whether we can f muster the political wisdom and courage to figure out how to uh, fill the vacuum in many ways with a with a, both a vision of what's gone wrong, but also a vision of what what we can do. And so I think that's a that's one of the things that we are symbolizing by by being here is to you know be out be out here, run into people a little bit, while also doing a, an, an in-depth analysis of our current thinking on, on uh, you know, Jimmy Dore uh, bullhorning himself. <laughs> At least he, <laughs> he's the alternative to Alex Jones. And truth and honesty is key in terms of, like, the deep events of our time and, like, we still need to get to the bottom of it. I mean, it's, people say, well, it's 21 years ago. No, it's still the seminal event of our time that has defined so much of what's taken place uh, since, obviously, you had since September 11th, of course, and then according to 11 9 that follows that, or 11 22, or whatever date you want it. There still hasn't been accountability for any of those in any meaningful way, shape, or form, and that doesn't look like it's changing with uh, the people who are, uh, in, uh, who are in control of uh, the 
prosecutorial elements of uh, the of the Trump administration. So, but uh, it's and it, we've been talking about this more like uh, there's room for concern, like with just how much like these manufactured weaponized culture wars are being escalated in terms of like it's interesting after we did that after we did uh, deep Ukraine and got into Malafiv and the Russian culture war that the the manufactured culture war gets escalated in a way it has it wow. a long long time wow. with this uh, and with not only not only the dra actually the draft you know itself in terms of uh, Alito uh, you know that is the Federalist Society's big guy at this point that, that's their guy uh, and he goes to Matthew Hale uh, as a jurist and, and, and very lots of issues in relationship to undermining the basics of certain aspects of American privacy in terms of the, uh, the individual is, is sovereign while then also then addressing the issue of the unborn baby and their and their concern for them, but there's an aspect of American principle that is definitely based in any legitimate fashion on we the people, we the people stand over the government, and that means that we the private people are there. But the combination not only of the specific aspect of the, uh, the potential ruling itself, but the leaking of it is really, like you're saying, is, is a totally provocative in relation to, yeah. to the culture war. And it's been a lot of pointing at some kind of, like, you know, uh, liberal aid or something like that. <laughs> well, but Antifa more and more the... to stalk Clarence Thomas and his family. <laughs> right. And, yeah, right. In a certain way, it, it begins to feel like the, you know, 2020 kind of uh, escalation of the culture war, where you see the arc of the summer of, uh, you know, of Antifa and Black Lives Matter, and then into the arc into January 6th and, you know, and, and the Kyle Rittenhouse trial, ultimately, and all that. But but it's definitely the case that this is being, this is, seems like a, there's a cultural provocation in the middle of the leak, and it's be, the people who continue to leak, actually, to the journalists, are people who are close to the Federalist Society justices, which is very interesting. And people began to, people who had covered the course for a long time basically said, this does seem to be, you know, a trying to shoring up of support uh, for this thing. But I then, you and I will analyze it, I imagine, in relationship to the artifice and the seditious nature of the culture war itself. Yeah. And when I say there's optimism and reasons for concern, like the, uh, the escalating of the culture war, because I'll, I'll go back to explaining this in a second. There is optimism, though, like, out here, um, we're talking about this in coming book we're hoping like with Ken Zier, to maybe open up a new conversation that hasn't been had in certain circles about the nature of conspiracy culture and that I mean mm. so there's a there's areas for openness as we've been talking about there are areas opening up um, we're going to do a podcast with a couple of a uh, couple of young ladies out here pretty soon. oh yeah doom and uh, doom and gloom podcast yes yes I'm looking forward to that Sebi and Allie there's things there are there are reasons for optimism and going back to what you said about uh, what can be bringing people together. Right now, like the, going back to this twins of like the war on terror and the culture war, the culture war is just as important as the war on terror. I mean, in some ways, domestically more important because while you've identified, Jeremy, that there just seems to be a, uh, a lot happening uh, economically, the long-term effects of COVID are going to start to, uh, as the shutdowns and lockdowns are going to start to really and ongoing COVID and yes, long, yes. long COVID affecting yeah. millions, while people deny that it was yeah. it was just the, the fact flu. that it's the fact that it's still not gone, combined with the short and long term economic the, consequences, the destruction of the economy. Yes, there's there's economic destruction. There's, uh, there's inflation. Yes, there's still COVID going on. There's a lot going on there, and then you've got of like the areas where like you could bring people together. This manufactured culture war is used as a way to. Uh, there's elements that want to use it to irreversibly split and separate society so that people can't come together on things. And it's going to be done through these issues. And this, these are the kinds of moments. This is obviously a moment of breakdown. And the United States is, uh, we are really getting in. We are into the slide, a protracted crisis. We are in a national crisis. Uh, uh, you know, we are in a return to our origin of crisis in many ways right now. And these are the moments where, again, these are vacuum moments. Where obviously, when something falls apart, or when, when the you know the the uh, belief 
the belief, the collective belief, let's say, in the national story is shaking apart in many ways for totally, not only good and legitimate reasons, but I would say existential reasons about not only the country, but what faces humanity, really. And, and, and this is a major, major moment uh, in terms of human history. And so these are the kinds of moments where there is chaos, much, much of it, or at least some of it, generated and weaponized and all of that. But some of it is whatever organic thing this is in relationship to humanity and the history of our own country and all of that. There's also that element going on here. And these are the kinds of moments where it's really important for, we might hope that the, not only the best of our, you know, the, the most courageous of our of our heart of our hearted people or the wisest of our minded people but inside of us are our better angels you know, are you know inside of you know as Jesus talked about in terms of the line between good and evil inside of a man's heart and so these are the, these are those kinds of I would say even spiritually existential moments where we uh, need to uh, f you know fill the void with uh, possible with with reality and possibility uh, at the same time. So, if the culture war and the terror war are the twin pillars of uh, chaos warfare and those really trying to just sort of use power and seek destruction, I would say, or create the ashes, then the, the then the you know courage and wisdom, uh, you know, spoken and acted into the public space from a very private. Uh, place of reckoning too that those are those that's the actual um, uh, salute the antidote and bringing it back to where we're at tonight 9-11 um, 11-9 vital both, both matters that's why we focus on so much and, and uh, there uh, why we focused on this so much for the last number of years and in the case of Jimmy Dore being here tonight not only is he not a help in this regard, but he's, active, he's an active hindrance in the way of getting any type of accountability or honesty out there about both events. And this, this reality, especially I think more so, I mean obviously he's much more staked his reputation on exposing 11-9 and Russiagate as, as a big lie or whatever. But uh, not dealing with this is going to, uh, it's a big part of these escalations that are continuing to take place, whether it's the whether it's the culture war, whether it's COVID escalations, or in any major, in any number of ways, like there's a there's a trickle down in terms of the consequences that come out of not discussing uh, the of the lack of or, and, and the active hindrance that for maybe some of the decent things he does and for some of the uh, good um, political conversations could be had from say a place like it is an active hindrance in the way of getting to the bottom of events that are key to why we find ourselves in the moment we're in right now. I agree, and, the, and in following up to, with that, I would just urge Jimmy Dore, I would let Jimmy Dore know that we're gonna continue to come critically for his destructive uh, work, and uh, that includes sort of playing into aspects of the culture war, but also his cover-up work, which is directly at the core of the terror war complex. Uh, but we are all, I would say I urge him too to like to dig deep on on considering how he could have covered, for example, the press correspondence dinner and the Trevor Noah, Trevor Noah thing in a more uh, wholehearted way uh, and and recognize, for example, what we I would say we would notice is that Trevor Noah, in the first minute of that speech, brought back together, the Me Too movement and the Harvey Weinstein folk, who we pointed out in our long-form series about the Epstein Maxwell cover-up, look to have been generated a divide, a weaponized divide and conquer with the Epstein Maxwell victims, specifically via the figures of David Boyce, but also Stanley Pottinger, tied in through his, uh, through his son to the uh, Trump administration, to China, to the COVID narrative, all of that, um, but he himself, uh, I've now found it looks like that uh, Stan Pottinger, you know, the guy who put himself in with boys with uh, Brad Edwards, the uh, quote-unquote original Epstein lawyer, who, by the way, we found out 
just from reading his book carefully again, not not digging in all kinds of old newspapers or uh, you know direct sources, but just reading books carefully and understanding to go look at the background or look who the author of an article is, uh, such as when Daphne Barak was writing the poo pooing article for the British uh, paper in relationship to the Maxwell uh, title. I just looked at that and said, oh, well, that's a weird name, isn't that, isn't that, I wonder if she's related to Ehud Barak. And then you go look and yeah, 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 that's the case. Okay, so we didn't, it's not like we dug up some kind of original research on the background of how Brad Edwards was brought into the Epstein Maxwell apparent legal cover up operation, uh, the one that appears to have just let Leslie Wexner off the hook that wants to go after Prince the Dandy Andy Prince Andrew rather than Ehud Barak at the heights of the Israeli state and military intelligence. We've joked that Prince Andrew is like the Saudi Arabia of the Epstein operation. <laughs> <laughs> it's so true. It's true. And and in many ways, R Russia is. We you know we've done an 11-9 analysis that's sort of similar to all of that. But again, I, I would for for. For Jimmy Dore, I would just for he needs to dig a little bit deeper in terms of something like where Trevor Noah said this very uncomfortable thing about Ronan Farrow being the ex exposer, by the way, the main journalistic exposer of the Harvey Weinstein Network and of Black Cube, by the way, David Boyce, right, tying to Ehud yeah. Barak and, and all of that, and then immediately follow it by talking about how this is a great event with all the powerful people and the media and the celebrities and the billionaires and the TV stars, you know, all the people who were hanging out at Jeffrey Epstein's <laughs> island. He tied it back together. Yeah. He bridged this architecture divide that we'd identified uh, earlier in this year and, uh, and we need more of that. And so Jimmy Dore, yes, uh, criticize, definitely legitimate criticism of the, the court's jester kind of role of the, of the neoliberal establishment that, uh, that obviously uh, Trevor Noah was playing. At the same time as, at the very least, expound upon yeah. maybe what he didn't say about what, going further with uh, Harvey Weinstein and yeah. Epstein Maxwell. And, but, you know, I, there, for some reason there's some discomfort there with Jimmy about the Epstein thing for some reason. Interesting. Well, um, we've gone, has we gone over an hour? I don't know. I have no it's been clue. a little while. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> been a little while. Um, do you uh, have anything else you want to discuss and maybe begin to uh, wrap up this particular stream? Uh, no, let's wrap it up. All right, all right. Uh, we are on location here at uh, Jimmy Dore at the Kansas City Improv Club. And yeah, I think we could do more of this in the future. Yeah. It might be the way to go instead of like trying to confront certain people head on. Both and. Both and. <laughs> <laughs> but more. And also, we're interested in doing like... Uh, you know, I'll get more. We used we, right before the pandemic, we were getting into doing yeah. readings on site, and actually, there's more places for us to do, uh, especially in the Kansas City area. When you're here, we can. There are uh, Israeli technology uh, uh, companies that are here in Kansas City. There's the National Nuclear Security Administration is here. Isn't that the one? Isn't that the one that Trump basically over? immediately withdrew the civil administrator uh, head of in the immediate wake of uh, 2020. <laughs> yes, I think so. And, you know, I 9-11 ground zero, I'll just say it again, Operation Jackal okay, but I, we won't go there at this point. That's too controversial, basically, for uh, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. All right, well, uh, we're going to sign off for now. All right. And uh, we are out over here. What's the name of this place, the larger... Uh, I think it's the Kansas. Oh, uh, this is Zona Rosa. Zona Rosa. Zona Rosa. It's like North an outdoor. It's like an outdoor mega mall.